Hello. Um, thank you so much for that. I really enjoyed that, Rebecca. So just out of curiosity, how many are not from Calgary? Everybody, okay. <laughs> Nancy and I, well, welcome. I was born in Calgary and I live here. And so it's nice to give a little um, hospitality and to recognize that we are on what's called traditional Treaty 7 territory. So in 1887, 1877, Queen Victoria signed a treaty with a number of local First Nations groups. And we are all treaty people. All of us who live here are still bound by that treaty. And as part of the work of truth and reconciliation, we're coming to terms with that and understanding what that really means. So I like to open with that. As Karen said, I'm a, an independent scholar, but I'm also a death doula and a ritual healing practitioner. And I studied at CIIS, did my doctorate in transformative learning and change. And I also have a lot of training and experience in energy medicine and animism and shamanic practices. And I work with dying people and their families, helping them navigate the process of integrating what happens around death, loss, and bereavement. And Rebecca, I so appreciated your presentation talking about the rituals that the dead need to get to where they need to go. Because that's really what I'm doing with my clients. I say my clients are the living, the dying, and the dead. And it's an exploration of what are the rituals we need in this culture that do get the dead where they need to go. It'll be different than, than other cultures. So I'm going to speak today about initiation and some of the theories that underlie the work I do with people, specifically that initiation is, is a rite of passage for everyone involved in the process. And I apologize, my abstract didn't make it into either the program or the, the insert, but uh, I was telling Marion and Karen, it did its job because I posted it on Facebook after it was accepted, and I got an email out of the blue from the senior editor at Parallax Press, asking me if I'd like to submit it as a book proposal. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought that worked. So it didn't make it in the, uh, <laughs> in the program, but <laughs> it's in the world. So uh, my work is really based on the idea that we need a new picture of what death is. And if we have a new picture, if we see it through essentially a different paradigmatic lens, we develop and, and have access to new tools and new frames for how to understand what's happening. And it really comes from my experience working with my clients that death is, is the end of the body, but really it's about much more than the body. It's about what happens when the body ends. It's about that next step. And integrating it requires that. And that it's, it's about meaning and relationship and soul and that much of our death dysfunctionality in this culture is because we don't address those. So if we're talking about meaning and soul and relationship, the tools we use are tools of that realm. Archetype, myth, ritual, image, symbol, art. So uh, I feel like when I show up to work with people, I have my little doctor's bag, but in it is words and myths and rituals and symbols. And those are the medicines. And they're as real as stethoscopes and antibiotics. They're a, they're a healing power. So today I'm going to speak specifically about archetypes, or particularly the archetype of initiation, although I use all those tools extensively in my work. And I really approach that as a map that gives a framework for what's happening as someone dies. And from that archetypal map, a mythic picture arises. And from that mythic picture, rituals can be developed as an enactment of that myth, and symbols and images are the tools of those rituals. So talking about the archetypal um, pattern of initiation and development and transformation. Of course, we have the classic archetypal stages, newborn, child, adolescent, adult. You get spouse in there and parent and elder. They're um, it's a kind of programmed sequence we go through. And each stage is mediated by a set of instinctual drivers. They're archetypal imperatives. The archetypes are something that, that as I imagine them, we both inhabit them and they inhabit us. There's an interrelationship there. And these archetypal drivers want fulfillment. They 
push our souls to the next stage of our development. We feel it as a calling. And that's why teenagers act out. I mean, part of it is hormonal. There's a physical aspect. Their bodies are changing. But they're pushing for freedom and independence. That's, a, that's the next evolutionary or initiatory stage they need to go through. And so these, these archetypal life stages follow the physical changes in our lives, but they're not synonymous with them. Just because something changes on the outside doesn't necessarily mean it changes on the inside. And our psyches and our souls don't, by default, follow the development of our bodies. And of course, we know this in, in adults who've never grown up and, and in whole societies which are essentially adolescent. We've never had that initiatory pattern. And of course, in, in North American society, which really is a good example of that, we, we end up going backwards. As people become, as they go from adolescent to elder, to adult, and then adult to elder, instead of a growth process, at elder, in a way, people are told to go back to being adolescents again. Suddenly you have no responsibilities. It's all about playing and being free. Where in another culture, elder would say, no, you have wisdom, and we need you. And we, you have a responsibility and a role here. So rites of passage rituals are what support our souls to make those shifts, to catch up on the inside to what's happening on the outside. And each rite of passage is a death and a birth. It's a death of the old and a birth of the new. You know, the, the marriage is the death of the single person. And the ritual confirms this birth and death. And of course, we, we know those are, are soul changes. They're not physical changes. They're um, internal changes. And for instance, in, in rituals around a newborn, right? in Christianity, they're welcomed with a christening. They get a name. They get an identity. Um, in, in Catholic confirmation, sometimes people get a new name. There's a real shift of identity that happens. In, in a baptism, which can happen to an adult, people can be born again. They are, they're old dies and they are born anew. And this identity is a soul phenomena. It's not a biological one. So we know that adoption as a ritual can embed and integrate someone into a family. It's the ritual that makes the transition happen. It's the public claiming. Marriage is the same way. You're claimed by another family. There's a set of relationships formed. Citizenship, same thing. You are, you're established and held in a community and become something new. You give up who you were and you become something new. And these all have a kind of till death do us part feeling to them. And it's not physical death, but it's soul level death. We're born into this new identity, and we have to die to it if we're going to leave it. And we know that from relationships. Divorce is a kind of death. So what happens in these rites of passage? The first thing that happens is that we are claimed. And in that claiming, existence is bestowed upon us. Our existence is a function of our relationality, a function of belonging. Again, this is soul existence, not physical existence. You know, the anthropological credo is that people are born. Humans are born, but people are made. And that the rituals are what make us people. And that identity of being claimed and your existence existing, your existence being validated by your connections, we see that in the opposite, which is shunning when people are excommunicated, ejected, banned. The phrase is, you are dead to me. Right? They're, they no longer exist because they're not claimed by that whole. And so we are our relationships. I've heard it described like the negative space, that all those things which we are in relationship surround us, and we are what exists because of all of them. And I love that image. So. In order to be, we need to be in a web of relationships. And this, this existence is tribal. It's first chakra. We say, what it tells us is that I am one of these people. Not who are my people, 
but who are the people of which I am one? Which is a different way of seeing it. Not who I claim, but who I am claimed by. And who is obligated through social or spiritual contract to assure that I exist? So who gives me life? To whom do I belong? So those rituals give us existence. They also give us meaning, get a role with each of those identities. The role of an adolescent is different than a child. An adult is different than an adolescent, an elder. At each change, we are um, given a framework, a map for what our purpose is in our community. New responsibilities, new conduct expected of us. So this is your job and that there are people depending on you to do it. You're needed and your existence matters. You have a place. And it, it holds us in difficult times. It's not always easy, but this is what your life is for. And you're called to something higher than yourself. So not only does the soul need to exist, but that existence needs to mean something. And both of those are dependent on relationship. So the meaning and the existence is relational. That The meaning of life, in a way, is to give your gift. And we need someone to receive that gift. So it's about the relationship between the part and the whole. That interplay is what gives us, makes us who we are at the most fundamental way. So our bodies change through our life. They grow up and rites of passage help us catch up. They allow the old self to die and the new one to be claimed. My argument is that we've forgotten in a Western secular society that, that's based on materialism, that there's a final stage in what happens to our bodies, which is that we die. That's one more physical change. But that physical change is just a physical change. It doesn't change at us at the soul level. And so we need to understand death as one further rite of passage, one further transition where we need existence and we need meaning and we need relationship. So I talk about ancestors, which is a, a non-Western framework. And it's, it's not only our blood relatives who have died, but it's all those to whom we are connected, who live in the other world, to put it in an animist frame. And it generally happens after elder. Right? There's, a, there's a sequence there, but of course it doesn't always. So it's a, it's a kind of wild card in the initiatory archetypal frame because it can pop in at any time. And ideally, we've moved through life, and at each of the stages, we've found new identities and new relationships. Now, we don't, we don't tend to do elder so well in this culture. Right? Uh, a retirement party is a pretty thin ritual to say this initiates you into the next phase of your life, and this is what your purpose is. And of course, there's a, there's a big statistical jump in suicides of older men because, in many cases, they, they can't find purpose and meaning anymore. So we're not doing it great all the way along, but we're really not doing it well at death. But we don't recognize death as another transition, and we don't recognize the ancestors as part of our community. Our picture of death is that it's a full stop. You know, a dead end. Th that's it, nothing. End of, end of existence. We don't even have words big enough to say how much nothing there is there. There's a lot of nothingness there. And dying doesn't change the fact that our souls and our psyches are moving towards this. And that, that abyss in front of us is the most terrifying thing we can imagine. I mean, no wonder we're so dysfunctional about death. When we look at it like that, it's inconceivable at every level. And we, we make it worse than it needs to be. We actively disown our dead. What do we say when someone's died? We say, we've lost them. Lost my grandmother. Well, who wants to be lost? That's an action that we on this side do. And it's not just in our language. It's truly a reflection of how we are in relationship with our dead. And it's a, it's a difference between a public truth and a private truth. The public truth that runs our institutions, our medical systems, our media, our research, education, is that 
officially dead is dead, end of story. But the private truth is very different. And when I, when I work with clients, it's always amazing to me. I know a lot of wild and weird and wonderful stuff in, in otherworldly venues, <laughs> to put it mildly. And, and people don't necessarily want to or they're not necessarily able to hear that. But as soon as someone in their life is dying or, someone, or they're dying themselves, and I talk about the fact that the role of the funeral is to get the dying person where they need to go, people nod their head as if that's the most normal thing in the world. Whereas if I had said another sentence about something else related, it wouldn't have flown. So we know at some private level that there is something that continues. And although we say, I lost my whoever, when someone's on their deathbed, we don't say, I'm going to lose you. We say, I'll never forget you. You'll live on in me. We know at that level that that's the way the relationship needs to be. But the public truth is that they're gone. You know, citizenship revoked, evicted from the village. And we don't talk about them again. It's unfamiliar to us. We're afraid of it. We're awkward around it. So people don't talk about the dead. Someone dies, and it's just not discussed. So in a way, they are, they are lost. So we actively disown them. And we also don't have the social structures and rituals to support the dying and soon to be dead and just dead person to go through the process that they need to go through. And I, I struggle a lot in language with this because there's the dying person and then as soon as they take their last breath, they're the dead person. But we don't have a word that says they're dead but they're not quite established in the village of the ancestors yet. They're making that journey. And we, we understand this when we say rest in peace. We understand that you can be peacefully dead and you can be not peacefully dead. And it's those rituals that make the difference. So one of my colleagues uses the word death journeyer. I don't know, it doesn't necessarily have the ring I want, but it does give you a, a frame for something else is happening in there. So we don't support this process. We don't help the dead, the dying and the recently dead, to understand their new role. What does it mean to be an ancestor? And what is your job as an ancestor? And what is your role in this community as an ancestor? And even before that, what is your job as a dying person? Because that's a, that's a, it's not a mistake that you're dying. It's difficult and it's sad. But death doesn't mean something is wrong. It's, it's how life works. And uh, one of my very first clients gave me a beautiful frame for this. He was 67, and he had five young adult children. And when I first met him, he, he knew what he wanted. And he said, I want my death to be the last great lesson I offer my children. And when I, I get goosebumps even when I say that. And that's one of the little bits of medicine I carry around with me. Because when I tell people that, all of a sudden, this frame that dying is a failure, is losing the battle, all the frames we have for dying, it changes. It says, oh, I have purpose. My dying has a meaning. And how I live my days, why I get up in the morning, or why I open my eyes every morning, matters. So when we start to see it as as part of a cycle, we give a different frame that supports the process. And so not only do we not have those structures for the dying people, we don't have the structures to understand that they will still be in our lives. You know, the classic is the Day of the Dead and cultures that have ancestor honoring events where we know at least once a year someone's going to have a picnic on your grave and your picture is going to be brought out, or all the other many, many different ways around the world that that is done. And I, um, I often work with clients, and, and we set that up. They, and one, we started in a conversation with one family, and it was a Friday night when we met. And um, we had this conversation about how do we do it. Anyway, the way it evolved was that they decided that every Friday night they'd light a candle. For the first year, they'd light a candle for him. And it was a kind of a date between the worlds, that he'd know 
that each Friday night they'd be there thinking of him. And if he was somewhere who could be in relationship with that, he would. And beautifully, he died on a Friday night. And, and for a year, every Friday night, they lit a candle for him. And they're simple. They don't need to be complex. Rituals are about patterns of energy more than about the trappings around them. So the other thing we do is that we ignore the relational changes that happen for the people who stay alive. So there's a rite of passage for the person who's died. They move to ancestor, and there's a whole ritual practice that we need to develop and reanimate around that. But things happen for those who stay alive. And there's, there's a way the wheel turns. And I think of this really, my first experience of this was about 18, 17 years ago. My niece is 17. So she was born, she's my, daughter's, my sister's first child, and she's the first baby, she was at that point, the first baby born in my family on that side in 25 years. So there'd been the cousins, we were, my sister and I, my cousins, and then 25 years later there was the next wave and she was the first one. And six weeks after she was born, my grandmother died. And she was the last of that generation. And there was this way you could just feel the wheel turning. Ella came in, Nana went out. My mom, who had been the adult with the elder above, suddenly she was the grandmother. And suddenly my sister and I were the adults because all of a sudden there were children. We couldn't be the children anymore because there were some underneath us. And so that, that birth and death change the experience for everyone. You know, in a Western individualistic culture, we like to think that, uh, that our death is our own and that even birth is personal. But of course, they're not. That's the life force moving through us. And you know, pregnancy and death are, at one level, incredibly personal, but at another, they're not. We are the vessels through which life moves. And when we start to see that and see that the births and the deaths are really community events in which everyone changes, we can change how we look at the identities of people and their existence and their relationship, that soul meaning part. So when a child is born, there are new people created. Suddenly there are siblings and parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents. There's a new, a new role created. Marriage is the same way. You get brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws. There are all these new identities created. And when someone dies, those things also happen. But we don't have the language for them. We have orphan and widow, widower. But we don't have, what's the, What's the word for a child, uh, for a parent whose child has died? That's, we don't have a word for that, but what these words give us is that there's a new spiritual status. When someone has been through that kind of a process, that kind of an experience, they are different. And if they've been supported to go through it with grace, they carry something for the rest of the community that is a benefit to us. So their initiation into something difficult creates in them a strength that is a service to the community. Now it's like the difference between soldier and warrior. A warrior has a new spiritual status. They've seen things that the rest of us haven't seen. And if they can carry that well, it's a beautiful service. So there's a transformation that happens to us as people change too. And that suddenly, new things are asked of you and you exist in your community as a different way, in a different way. Which is why traditional mourning rituals matter so much. Because one of the classic things that happens when someone is bereaved is they walk through the world and everybody in the grocery store looks normal. But inside you just know it's not normal. He's dead. Right? That's, it's a profound change on the inside. And we need to balance those inside outside. So you shave your head, or you wear black, or you wear an armband. That says to the world, I am, I'm in a liminal space. I'm in a different spiritual configuration right now. And I, I both can't be expected to be normal, and I have access to something 
that is not always accessible. So it's, it's a, a, a balance both ways. So for both the dying, dying and dead person and for those who continue to live, and perhaps for the ancestors on the other side, identities need to be remade as we die. And the, uh, the act of a ritual and a rite of passage and seeing it in that process gives us a new frame for what's happening. That the soul needs that connection still, but the connection will be different. And I'm going to stop there and just, just end with a phrase that I love that has another one of those little bits of medicine I carry around, and it comes from the pagan tradition, and it's that what is remembered lives. And it's simple, but it's deep. It says we do not die. We do not die if we're not lost. And there's a tradition in Mexico that people die three times. The first time is when they take their last breath. The second time is when their body is put in the earth. And the third time is when their name is never spoken again. So that holding and community and village making is really the healing approach to death and dying. And one of my teachers says, the art of a good death is that it's a village-making event. And I use that as kind of the mantra in the work I do. How do we create right relationship in the village? And that involves each initiatory process. It's all about reconfiguring relationships as someone leaves this side and goes to the other side. So we'll stop there, and we have a few moments for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you mentioned a materialistic nature of our society, and I wonder if our Western capitalistic framework for understanding the world affects our conception of the worth of those after death, because they have no That's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about how capitalism puts an economic value on everyone and that ancestors are not of any quote-unquote economic value. And I guess the, the other part of this frame, which is <coughs> going to be in the book, <laughs> is <laughs> this idea that it, it is the Western frame that creates this dysfunctionality and materialism, reductionism, linearity, individualism. All of those are the antithesis of the medicine we need for death. Um, but what their, what their value is, is interesting. I mean, certainly materialism, that's a whole other conversation. Materialism says we are what can be measured and seen. Things happen in three dimensions and we have five senses. End of story. Anything beyond that is extrasensory, supernatural, paranormal, unusual. We have all these lines that say if we don't understand it and can't control it, we'll label it as something that doesn't exist. When in fact, those things exist all the time and people have all sorts of quote unquote non-ordinary, we don't even have a word to describe it rather than in reference against, experiences around death. And those experiences of deathbed communications and dreams of the dead and near-death experiences, they are a huge medicine to help us meet death because it says it means something more. So that's slightly off your question, but it, it, it does say that the frame prevents us from accessing what could be healing. Just to comment on what you said, I have a, a friend who's 85, um, and she says that she believes that, that death will become accepted um, by, by the baby boomer generation as baby boomers start to die, and it's like the new, not quite fast, <laughs> but it's, 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 they understand, you know, like we did all these things together, and now we're starting to die, and now, and then people start to figure out how to make money on it, and that's that's how um, Western society will embrace death. Well, it's that's hilarious. The, the new fad. It certainly is a boomer-driven process. Totally. The and they brought in midwifery, and now they're going out again. Right. And there is, you know, people talk about the new death movement or the death positive movement, and. It hasn't quite popped its head above, above the cultural radar yet, but I'm, I'm in that world, and it is rich and teeming with creativity and ways for people to 
make money is one way, but also to, um, to engage in a right livelihood, yeah. right? That, that when we push away death, we push away the gifts of people who are called to deal with death. And there are lots of people who come and take my trainings who have always wanted to be around death, but they've always been teased by their friends as being the weird ones. You know, you're spooky or you're macabre. But that's really their soul's calling. Mm -hmm. because, uh, so I had three questions, but that told me which one to ask you. So I'm a no one dies alone volunteer. Oh, wonderful. So because I felt called to be with the dying. And just like you say, you know, it's such a joyous experience, and it's so hard to tell, to describe that to people, um, because they think you're, you're weird, you want to be around them. But implicit in this, no one dies alone, is that it's important to be with someone when they're dying. And I wonder what you had to say about that as a deaf doula, because that seems like that's what you, you are doing, you're accompanying them. You're the psychologist. The psychopomp. So psychopomp uh, comes from the Greek means psyche and pomp. Psyche is soul and pomp is guide. So a psychopomp is the guide of souls. And that can either be a human guide or a non-human uh, supernatural guide. Uh, so dying alone, that's a big kind of conversation. One of my favorite lines in this comes from the highly respected spiritual text of Rolling Stone magazine, <laughs> where uh, Lou Reed's widow, Laurie Anderson, said, the purpose of death is the release of love. And another little bit of beautiful image magic there. So it, it has to do with that village making. People sometimes do need to actually take their last breath when they're alone. And there are lots of stories of, you know, the family's in the room 24-7 except for 10 minutes and that's when they go. So that's, that's people's own choice and there's a mystery to that we don't understand. But that there should be a village of love around them. You know, whether or not you're actually in the room with them is not so much the issue. It's much how much are they held and how much are they claimed and how much do we as the living take responsibility for how we need to support them in their first steps on the other side. In a way, they're newborns there and we have, we have a role to hand them off to the ancestors and so I don't, I don't actually know if anyone is ever alone when they die. I think that at, at a spiritual level, if nothing else, there are beings who are there supporting it. Thank you very much.